Guess what, guys? It's Thursday. It's 1 p.m. here in Texas, and that means it's time for a good old-fashioned Texas scent party. So I am your host, Leah Laxtons. I'm a native Kentuckian with a passion for hemp. Got my two awesome co-hosts with me here today. We've got Captain Cannabis. Hey, guys. In the holiday spirit. And, of course, our producer, Cynthia Morales. You're down, down in deep South Texas, too, right, Cynthia? Yes, for the next. The next couple of weeks. <laughs> Live in that valley life down in the RGV. And I'm super stoked with our two guests today. We've got Paul hey from Gringo Delivered here in Austin, Texas. What's up, Paul? Hey, guys. And we've got Katie from Kentucky, from Kentucky Hemp Works, the queen hey. of hemp TikTok. We're going to talk about that, too, a little bit. I think that's how I found you. You had this really amazing uh, TikTok where it was like you had the hemp and you were in the car and you're like, it's hemp. And that's, I was like, oh, I got to connect with this chick. It's too cool. Got some good looking hemp right there behind you for sure. So let's get right into it. Katie, tell us a little bit more about Kentucky Hemp Works and what the scene's like over there in Kentucky. Of course, one of the leaders, the first states to grow hemp again uh, in 2014. What, what's been going on with you? Well, so uh, as I, I, I like to say, uh, when you're a leader, that means you're the first one to get like smacked in the face or hit the roadblocks and, and things like that. So we, we've certainly discovered quite a few obstacles and hurdles. Um, so being a leader, sometimes it helps to be the second person. And then you just let, you know, kind of let, let it fizzle out. But um, but but things have been going really well here. Um, so I'm the owner of Kentucky Hemp Works, and we are a seed processing facility in in Western Kentucky. We basically cold press hemp seeds for the hemp seed oil that's that's inside the seeds. The byproduct of that, of course, is the protein, the uh, the the seed cake, which could be used as a protein powder, going to animal feed, and things like that. But we also use the roots of the plant. We use leftover stalks and fiber materials to make different things. Um, we have a lot of exciting things that are kind of in the works. So we're really can't wait to launch after Christmas, maybe. Um, but for the most part, we, we kind of we do the normal, the typical CBD tinctures and that kind of thing. But we also include products from from the whole rest of the plant as well. Um, and one of the things that we're, we love doing the most, of course, besides educating, is providing raw materials for other people to do what they do best. So whether that's sending hemp protein to someone to make gourmet dog treats or sending fiber to somebody to make what they, you know, paper um, or even hemp seeds, you know, to make our historic hemp bourbon, which was la launched uh, the other last weekend that with a distillery that's that's close by so Yay, uh, raw materials awesome. and then of course we have our own line of products and and spend a lot of time educating as well yeah this bourbon thing was really cool I saw that on your Facebook so because obviously bourbon has to be aged so mm -hmm. this really makes you appreciate like life and how long things take and having patience because you worked on this project what was it five years ago and then boom now the bourbon is here the bourbon is here and just blowing everybody's minds. Yeah, when when we first planted that crop, it was a seed crop and, and we never expected that somebody would wanna use it for a new bourbon recipe or or even, you know, there's folks making moonshine out of our hemp seeds too. So wow. it's just stuff that we don't know how to do. I'm not, I'm not much of a bootlegger, so, uh, but I, I can provide hemp. So for other people do you, to do what they do best. Yeah. Katie, do you provide um, smokable hemp too? or flower? We, we don't sell it because we're license holders and that's currently illegal in Kentucky. A lot of people do sell it anyway, um, especially if they're not a hemp license holder because then they don't really have anything to lose. Um, we, we don't wanna lose our processor license, so we currently don't, um, but, but there are a lot of uh, farmers that we work with here that are trying to sell their smokable material and they are allowed to sell it out of state. So if they, if they have a contract for, you know, all of their flour, they can, 
they can send it to another state and their state can get the tax revenues. Uh, but unfortunately, Kentucky can't. So we're kind of trying to trying to skate over that issue and not get in, into trouble. But at the same time, it's legal to ship it out of Kentucky. So, you know, we, we can help find some if you need it. It's been That's a really good. interesting process. Like here in Texas, we're going through some things on the smokable uh, uh, ban. They tried to ban it and it's been delayed now. The court dates in February, uh, but they were kind of like, look, where you can still sell the flour. That could be tea where we just, they don't want to see pre-rolls, you know, that was the big beef the state had, which that's delayed right now. You can still buy pre-rolls, but uh, it's been really interesting seeing every state have sort of their own take on this. Like Indiana is like, you can't even smoke it in our state. You know, other states are all about it. We're kind of in the middle, but I, I know that was uh, really interesting when I first realized that Kentucky, you're not allowed to grow smokable flour. That was the first I had sort of heard of that. And then that came into our bill that was written here in Texas as well. So, you know, you can see it from the law enforcement perspective, but it's also like they're taking all the fun out of it. So come <laughs> on, guys. <laughs> it's crazy. Well, Paul, let's get over to you. Tell us a little bit about Green Go Delivery and what you guys are doing here in Austin, Texas. Thanks, you guys. Um, so Green Go started last year. Um, and you know, if we're outside of Texas, it's really hard to see, but delivery has, the delivery model, the on-demand delivery model has been around California since we legalized medical cannabis, medical marijuana back in 1996. It's just Michael and I got together last year and realized that nobody's doing it here in Texas at all. And we know not just because of the people coming in from California, but because also Texas, this is like one of the, the second largest state in the union and we don't have cannabis delivery. So, you know, we didn't decide to go the health and wellness route like everybody else. We're being a little bold and a little, well, as um, Katie put it, we're kind of the first ones to say that we're here to get you high legally. Um, so that's really our mission. We know we're helping people. We know the tons of medical benefits. We have a doctor on our advisory board that that's, you know, helping us help people. But the marketing around that is really um, something nobody's doing. and. Because of that, we've had a lot of problems like with getting credit card processors. Banks are like, you want to do what in Texas? <laughs> no, goodbye. So it's been a long road. Um, again, like Katie said, it's really difficult being the first person to do it. Um, and I, oh God, Katie, when you said that, I resonated with that so hard. So we got our credit card processing and the bank knows all that, about what we're doing. They're cool with us getting high, people high legally and they're cool with us using the words cannabis. Um, and now we're, we're now we're trying to conquer Facebook and Instagram marketing. <laughs> yeah. It's a oh, never ending boy. battle, you guys. It's like there's so many hurdles. It's like, oh come on, please make it easier. But you know, what we need to do is just give Mark Zuckerberg a call. Someone just needs to talk to him about the plant. Hey, Mark. Yeah, the plant is it's good. It's legal. It's good for everyone. You well, know what's what's your deal, buddy? It's just him. <laughs> it's just him. <laughs> Yeah, I know we, we've really followed your journey here, Paul, because we met last year as you guys were really rolling this out and seeing everything you've accomplished has been really incredible. Uh, tell us a little bit about, so you guys did a really cool viral marketing uh, piece around your the delivery service and your products. You guys went down to, in Austin, to um, like the park, Zilker. Zilker Park, right? Yeah, So so we just, you know, um, we just wanted to get the word out there. Um, about what we were doing. We actually weren't intending to sell any products at all because we didn't have any products to sell. We just had bulk gummies, Delta 8 gummies to give away. And we just wanted to tell people about the app and snag their email address or an Instagram follow um, and tell them that the, you know, this, this Apple app is coming and this Google app is coming and it'll be on your phone and we'll be able to deliver to your door in 60 minutes or less. And then people just started DM DMing us and saying, hey, how can I get this now? And after like telling the first, like, I think 10 people, hey, we're not ready. We're like, dude, we should just like, you know, get gummies and, and vape carts and free rolls and flour and start now because we're leaving money on the table. And what's crazy, this blows my mind, you guys. We made five-year financial projections um, for this financial model of our business, but it was only after receiving 1.7 million in, in private equity capital. But the crazy thing is we did, that guerrilla marketing event at Zilker, we did it one Saturday for three hours, another Saturday for three hours, and another Saturday for three hours. 
last Saturday in September into the first two Saturdays in October. And we're beating the model from the, the financial wow. model with just <sighs> that market. So we severely underestimated the market. We really did. Um, so uh, it's good, um, but you know, it's a problem. To, it's a good problem to have. That's so, incredible. Sure. And you guys still are working on the app, right? So it's like here, yeah. you're blowing through it. They were waiting for credit card processing to finish quality assurance testing or QA testing. So now that we have it, um, uh, QA testing can resume and we hope to be submitted to Apple or Google before the end of the year, but it's like a week away. So, you know, being on the software development side for 30 plus years, I know that, you know, everything takes way longer than you planned. Always. But we are really excited to bring it to everybody. Thanks for the shout out. Yeah, that is awesome, yeah. Paul. So hey, be sure yeah. to go. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to, I want to say something too uh, with, with this in mind, Paul. This is incredible because I think I did try the gummies, the D8 gummies. And, 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 you know, for a lot of people, maybe that are watching this, if, if you haven't heard, I mean, the D8 gummies gives you a, a very nice buzz. Oh, yeah. And, uh, but they're made legally from, from low uh, THC hemp, uh, but it is Delta 8 uh, THC that came from this hemp plant, which don't you love the science? Things keep changing. Oh, so, it, but yeah. the thing is, it's a really nice buzz. And, and uh, I mean, it feels like, just like what you'd want in a buzz and yet it's totally legal and is it just makes you feel happy you it's know what beautiful. i mean it's beautiful you know daniel that's really good and and i told you about our goal right to get people high legally what really st started making me cry was when when one of my friends said hey you know i have severe ptsd and i'm not self-harming at night because i take one of, a half of one of your gummies every night and my husband wants to thank you and my, my kids want to thank you. And I was like, oh my God, we're actually helping people. Oh my God. And yeah. we're getting people high. Like I thought it was really easy to get out of bed now. Now it's like, it's so easy to work until 1.30 a.m. and get up at 7 a.m. again because there's this mission there, right? So even though we don't want to market it on the medical side, like the health and wellness side, like, 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 like a lot of people are doing, um, it's still really cool. And it still really touches my heart that we're actually helping people. And, and yeah, so we can make them, you know, the gummies as strong or as weak as we want. The most popular so far has been 15 milligram gummies, but we ran out. Um, so we had to do 30 milligram gummies. Um, some people are cutting them in half. Some people are taking the whole, I mean, we can make them, you know, there's no, unlike THC in California, I'm not sure if you're aware or in the other adult use markets like Colorado, Nevada, et cetera, you can't have more than hundred milligrams of Delta 9 THC per package. So they usually make like 100 milligram chocolate bars or you know, um, 100 milligrams total gummies and like each gummy will be 10 milligrams Delta 9. We're not regulated yet. There is absolutely no regulation around Delta 8 THC at all. So we're just going crazy and seeing what sells. And what we're finding is that the lower milligrams gummies sell actually a little bit better than the higher milligram gummies. Wow. And That's I think it's, it's really interesting point to see how many people uh, in states like Texas where we you know, have a very limited medical program and really no access to higher THC outside of the black market, that this does stop individuals from trying these products. Because sometimes you're like, whatever, they're just going to buy it anyway. But getting a legal form is really important to a lot of people. Being able to partake in cannabis legally is important to them. Like they're law abiding citizens. They want to do things the right way. So I think Delta eight now, granted, we do see that there will be regulations coming and there's going to be some, some battles coming on that yeah. front. But for now, it's very interesting to see it as an unregulated cannabinoid, uh, just exploding at least here. Uh, Katie, what's it like in Kentucky is, is Delta eight hit big there as well? Yeah, for sure. Um, we kind of have the same issue that we have with the smokable, where not everybody's able to, or, or not everybody is choosing to take advantage or, or to market Delta 8 because of our permit process and that kind of thing. Um, but it's huge. It's huge. It's all over the place. Um, you know, and, and the only downside to having it where you don't have the, the regular like the local growers, the local processors involved is we're kind of getting like gas station versions of it yeah. where those are being sold, but the good quality stuff is not being sold because the processors and the, the manufacturers here that have licenses aren't really ready to take that risk. 
So, so we're missing out, you know, and having too many regulations on hemp is causing, it's causing the sort of import China import stuff to be sold all mm -hmm. over the place where mm -hmm. while the local stuff uh, it, that is regulated is not being sold at all. So it, it's kind of, kind of frustrating, but at the same time, there's a lot of people out there making money on Delta eight right now in Kentucky too. So yeah, you know, no, it's really that, that's a great point for sure. Like we see that here in Texas as well. At, at, at first when D8 came on the scene, it was just like the worst quality. Now we're starting to see some local manufacturers get involved limitedly. And I think a lot from the West Coast that, you know, are more experienced with THC products. Uh, so starting to see some better products come online. But that was certainly my concern initially is like, great, we're back to the gas station gummy days of CBD. So starting to see it evolve. And that's a necessary part of this process is when you're just like, no, as a state, people are still going to be here selling it. It's just not going to be the people that you want involved in the process for sure. Yeah. You know, it's funny is that it, it seems like, you know, for you and me uh, and being entrepreneurs for so many years and we've met so many people over those years and it's so interesting when they get to know you, you come to come to find out they uh, smoke um, uh, from the black market. And it was really interesting. I, I would say well over 95 percent of every business owner that we, we really hung out with and they got to know us, they all smoke. And, but but the, here's the thing is, I just wonder if these laws that were written uh, by our great, great grandparents, <laughs> if, if we're all just following this like machine, this set of rules, when in reality, I mean, all, everyone in, in say 90, per, could you imagine if 90% of the whole country has been smoking illegally, but for some reason, they, everyone's like, well, I can't say anything because I'll be the first uh, senator to say something. Oh, I can't say I'll be the first. It's like, we're all doing it, guys. Yeah. <laughs> so let's just yeah. Like the worst it? kept secret, you yeah. know, for sure. <laughs> it's <laughs> that. Attorneys are smoking, you know, yeah. like, the, like Kim Ogg out of Houston. She's a huge proponent of cannabis. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, but we do see these laws starting to loosen up, you know, with the, the latest Gallup poll, like 60, over 60% of Americans are, I uh, think that smoking cannabis is morally acceptable, you know, like those are huge numbers that are up tremendously from just 10 years ago. So I think people are really starting to understand more what it's all about, you know, and that it doesn't lead to all the propaganda that we've seen from the past. Now on the note, talking about regulators, of course, Kentucky is very uh, central in this whole hemp debate that's been going on for many years. Uh, Senator McConnell really did a lot to push forward the hemp bill back in 2014, or I guess it was 2013, kind of getting rolling, passing in 2014. And now uh, Rand Paul, Senator Paul, has actually come out this week with the Hemp Act, where he wants to do a lot of, uh, seems like good things for the industry, go from 0.3 to 1%, which farmers and processors are majorly asking for. Like it's a huge issue. Well, Katie, you being a processor, I'm sure run into this that, you know, when you're extracting, sometimes it's hard to stay under 0.3. Isn't it more important what's in that final product? So like trying to regulate it all the way through is crazy. So do you have any thoughts about the, the Hemp Act and um, any insights maybe on if you think it'll pass? Yeah, um, I'd love I'd love to share about it. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know how how well it's gonna like how quickly it's gonna pass. But I do think this is something that has nearly universal support across the hemp industry, all fifty states. Um, essentially, where this came from was if if you recall, the USDA opened their comment period, and they actually had it open multiple times. They had their comment period open. And, and people from all over the country wrote to the USDA and said, here, here are my main concerns. Well, Senator Paul and his team there, they kind of looked at those concerns and the four issues that he hit on in this Hemp Act of 2020 are, are the top four out of the concerns. They're, they're sort of the ones that are pretty universal. Um, obviously, there's, there's other things that, that could be touched on, but um, these seemed like to be the highest priority. And, and those four issues, uh, first of all, of course, 
raising THC from 0.3% to 1%. It helps with genetics. It helps with farmers uh, as they're out in the field. You know, nobody needs to have their crop destroyed for having hemp that's 0.4% THC. <clears throat> and even if, let's say by some, you know, a turn of events, you even go up to 1% THC on your hemp crop, it's still like lower than the lowest marijuana in the world. I mean, there's Mexican ditch weed that that's got higher THC content than one percent hemp. So it does it doesn't it's not logical to destroy crops that are a half of a percent of THC by dry weight. So uh, so the first thing is get that THC limit up to one percent, which is a little bit more reasonable. Personally, I'd love to see it at 3% or gone completely. But if we do have legal marijuana that's federally legal, some states are still not going to have legal marijuana. So we do still need a delineation between two, hemp and marijuana for those states that don't yet have it like ours for some reason. Um, the second main issue is getting testing off of the farm, like you mentioned, off of the farm completely, leave our farmers alone for once and then put that testing on the finished product. Uh, there's a lot of little residual benefits that, that, that come from that, um, including even in the marijuana industry where it's been noted that, you know, marijuana crops are having to destroy their fiber after they're done harvesting, which doesn't make any sense. So, you know, there's, there's other benefits there, but the real benefit is to the, to the farmers for getting the bureaucrats off the farm and to the consumers who, who will you know, be able to say, okay, well, I know this is legal hemp. I know it's less than 1% THC, um, that, that kind of thing. So the third main issue is transportation issues. You know, we've heard the, the horror stories of truckers with a semi-truck full of hemp getting pulled over in Oklahoma, which is funny because you know, they're growing marijuana there. Yeah. But, um, but those kind of things don't have to happen. And, and Senator Paul, I know he heard a lot from transportation and logistics companies. And so that, that was really directed at, you know, you carry a certificate showing that your THC level is less than 1% and then you just go. Doesn't matter what border you're crossing, just get it to the, the place and keep that, keep that lab report on you basically. And then the last thing is a, a, basically a standard for the measurement of uncertainty on labs, it would set that standard at 0.075%. So that's essentially the margin of error for labs. Um, the USDA had chosen just like a, a term, measurement of uncertainty for the, for the uh, margin of error, but they never said what that measurement was. So everybody wrote, you know, wrote in on their comments, like, we don't know what this is. You need to pick a number or like pick some kind of standard that we can go by and so uh, Senator Paul looked at the suggestions. He increased it a little bit. I think most of the suggestions were like, give us a half a point, you know, a half a half a percentage there or, or half of a half. And he just bumped that up a little bit to 0.075%. So that would be like a plus or minus 0.75%. So those are the four main issues. Um, it, it just dropped on Tuesday. I don't even think the bill is officially filed yet, but they did do the press release on, on Tuesday. And, um, and so far, it seems like the support is, is pretty substantial for it. Um, and I will say the American Farm Bureau Federation has already come out in support of 1% THC. So that really bodes well when you have the largest farm advocacy group in the country coming on board with it. That just, that goes a long way. So, so the big thing right now, and um, I know I don't want to ramble on on this topic too much, but the big thing to always make sure to get in there is that action item. Um, and the action item for this bill is to call your legislators, your U.S. senators. Right now, we're, we're, it's a Senate bill, so we're looking at two senators per state and ask your U.S. senators to co-sponsor the bill or to, to vote for the bill. You know, any, any support that they can give for this legislation, we, we need that. Um, and hopefully, hopefully we can get some co-sponsors when the bill is filed again in January in the new session. That's awesome. Great insights there, Katie, on that topic. I know you're very politically active on for the hemp community. So I love getting your input there. We do have a question. That's code for 
pain in the ass. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> That's the only way you have to add. I think advocacy is all about being almost like where you keep them still wanting to talk to you, but like you're right on the edge. You got to walk yeah, that line. Yeah. Keep them you on know? their toes. Yep. That's what we do. No <laughs> doubt. It's really nice though, because if we do approach them and, and you know, like a, a customer, right? If you if you want a customer to buy into what you're saying, if you uh, if you really get to know them and and listen to them and then give them a big hug, I mean, the plan is teaching us peace and love, right? So I, I think I think that we really should get closer to our senators and and when they see us, make them the way we approach, make them want to talk to us and and be really excited to see us. That's what we're going to get to. Yeah, no doubt. So. And Katie, we do have a question from Facebook for you on how you store your hemp before it's processed. So uh, our storage and the way that we actually logistically, the way that we do things here is going to be very similar to your average grain farm. Um, so whereas with a like, so the farmer that we work with, he grows for CBD, but he also grows for seed. So the CBD is getting sent off to a big, fancy, high-tech, state-of-the-art CBD processing facility with like a chemist and all the stuff we can't afford here. Um, but what our grower is growing for us is the seed. So that's getting combined. Like if you're familiar, for those who, who don't live in the boondocks, um, a combine will just kind of come across the field and scoop up everything and it chews it all up. And it actually strains out the seeds or the corn or the soybeans or, or whatever it is that you're planning to harvest. So in our situation, we've got the combine settings set for what works for our hemp seeds. And that thing will strain out all the green stuff and most of the grasshoppers and the other things you find in the field. Um, and then it, it'll go into a grain bin, just like corn, just like soybeans. Only the difference is this grain bin's got a, a fan in it. And because with the hemp, you actually harvest it green. And this is a little bit of something that we had to learn. Most people don't realize, but you're harvesting your crop green, which is very different than with corn and soybeans. The corn and soybeans, you, you actually are harvesting them after they're all dried up and they're practically falling off the stem. Um, with hemp, it's green. So we've got to get it in a grain bin that's got a blower and it blows air through the whole thing, blows some of the, the leaf material out the top. And it'll stay there for a couple of weeks until that moisture content is low enough that we can store it safely. In, if you can see my beautiful white bags behind me, these bags, so it, it'll typically be in a grain bin. It's the safest there. Um, but then once we get it in, we actually, we've got a seed cleaner that does another screening plot process and gets little bits of stem. You know, we have a lot of stems in there and you might get a, a stink bug and some morning glory seeds or, or the other weed seeds that are out in the field that get picked up as well. So we clean that and we'll store it in these bags here uh, until we're ready to crush them. And wow. It's the life cycle of our oh, hemp seeds. <laughs> that's so cool. What an interesting process mm -hmm. and, and very interesting too, the differences between hemp seed oil growing for CBD, but that this farmer is able to grow for both. That's really cool. And then just send the two separate processors to get these end products out there. Awesome stuff. Well, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some other news that came down this week. So um, another little crackdown here. Uh, I like marijuana moment. It's one of my favorite news sources, by the way, for anybody out there looking for really accurate up-to-date news. So the FTC came out. They apparently had like an entire uh, media team here, Operation CB Deceit. They've come out with these graphics and everything. And essentially what they're saying is they're going to continue to crack down on CBD manufacturers who are making outrageous claims. Uh, and, you know, that's we see this in the industry like it is out there. There so are people that for what right, like for whatever reason, want to just say that it cures everything, you know, and and certainly CBD is fantastic for a lot of things, but making these kind of outrageous claims, it's a lot. Now, that being said, I'll say that there are pharmaceuticals that are also some of the claims are crazy on the things like that they can do. So it's interesting that they've decided to put all this money into just one, uh, against one industry here. 
Um, you know, like I can, you can argue it both ways. I think that yes, as an industry, we're a new industry. We need to just, everyone needs to make sure they're being professional. Don't be outlandish. That being said, like, it's interesting. They're spending so much time and money targeting this when you have even like the vitamin industry, like, you know, multivitamins, do they even work? And it's like, this is for, you know, multivitamin for everything. So what are, what are y'all's comments on this? What do you think, Paul, good or bad for the industry or neutral? I, I think, I, I don't know, maybe I'm speaking the wrong for everybody, but I think all of us in this room think that the regulation is good because you guys, we spoke about this, I think at CBD Expo, there's so many people selling snake oil out there. When, we, when, when Michael and I started this company in August of last year, we literally went to every single trade show until we had to stop in February and we were getting samples from every single company. And like one company like CBDFX, for example, is saying broad spectrum gummies. And when Michael scanned the COA and we're on the phone with the girl, like, well, yeah, we don't feel any effects and it's been four hours, you know? And, and Michael's like, Paul, it's a CBD isolate. And we're like, what? No, it's this broad spectrum. And they're literally lying right there in the label. It's clearly on, the, if you look at the lab report, it's an isolate. And, and they're, so the advertising claims, um, the, exact, the claims of exaggeration, um, all that has to be reined in. And typically, you know, uh, it's either done on a self-regulating level, which is what we've been able to do in the video game industry. No regulations on video games at all because the, the, the ESA, Electronic um, Software Association, came in and said, we're going to self-govern ourselves because otherwise the government is going to do it. So if the hemp industry actually does that and does it well, then the government will need, won't need to do that. But if we don't get our act together, they are going to do it. And even though I, I'm, I'm pro regulation, I would much rather it be self-regulation because we know what's best for us and we know what's best for the free market. Um, and, you know, whenever the government gets involved, like, you know, regulating Delta 9 THC as the only cannabinoid in the entire cannabis industry, that's just silly. Come on, you know, um, you, so we know they're going to do it wrong and we'd rather not wait another 10, 15 or 20 years for them to get it right. So that's just my personal take on it. My opinion, sorry. Yeah, no, I think that's great comments. Uh, what do you think, Katie, about this coming down from FTC? Well, I agree with Paul 100%. Um, I, I um, you know, I, it, it's kind of, you know, I'm a very libertarian kind of person. So, you know, I, I kind of uh, have to balance between wanting something to, to keep consumers safe, but also how much do we want the government to be in charge of that? I mean, look at everything else they've ever done. Um, so you, we know they're not good at things. Um, so with this, I, I, but I a thousand percent, I know it's not even a real number, but let's make it like I, I infinity percent agree with Paul that we need to self-regulate the hemp industry. Um, there's some standards that are out there and, and we've talked about, you know, creating standards and, and it's a long process. It's a lot of work. Um, but if you look at everybody in the industry, if we come together as a federation of states and associations and networks from all 50 states, we could easily put our heads together and get a, put a, you know, everybody put in a little bit of work on this and get a standard that, um, that you know, we can get consensus on. Um, cert, just simple things like, hey, if you say there's a thousand milligrams in there, make sure there's a thousand milligrams in there. Or if you say it's less than 0.3% THC or 1% THC, make sure it's not 10% THC and those, those kinds of things. But then even things like, like our good agricultural practices, that's GAP, we call it gap in, in the, on the farm um, and GMP, like good ma manufacturing practices, good laboratory practices, all of those things have already been done. And the FDA already has an entire set of standards on food safety and processing and all that. So if you even look at the existing hemp standards that are out there right now, those have all been taken just from what's already been done by the FDA. You know, th those standards, we're not asking people to do, to reinvent the wheel, but meet the same standards that we have for all food and cosmetic processing. And, and then add some things that are specific to cannabis in general. Um, but yeah, so I, I agree hundred percent. I would love to see some of those regulations come in the form of self-regulation or industry standards. Um, I like the word standards better than regulation too. Cause you know, 
it feels more like we built this ourselves. These are our standards as opposed to the government saying, here's what we want you to do. And if you don't do it, we're going to throw you in jail and, and burn your crop and, you know, burn all your money. I think this is where, this is where hemp tours uh, comes in because one of the first things I ever heard was from Leah talking about putting COAs on every single package. This was going back to mid, you know, like Q3 of 2019. And I was like, oh man, I'm like, that's really brilliant, you know? And, and most, I'd say most people are doing it. Most end, you, end products are doing it, but I still see maybe 20% of the products out there that don't have the COA or QR code on there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, and we're talking products that are, for example, I have a nephew that has a lot of mental health issues like OCD and um, uh, severe anxiety. And uh, his doctor, his psychiatrist had recommended CBD. And the CBD that my sister got from the doctor, no QR code whatsoever, no website, no telephone number, no physical. I tried to look them up on the internet, I couldn't find them. And it was, it was 250 milligrams of CBD in a 60 milliliter bottle. And I said, and she, and she, she gave up because it wasn't working. I was like, Jennifer, there's no CBD in there. I'm like, first of all, I mean, even if there is, we can't verify that there is because we don't have a lab report. Yeah. So here's yeah. another thing too, that um, <clears throat> well, we, we found, especially when it came to the um, uh, beverage industry, uh, some of the mistakes that they've made is that cannabinoids um, are, you know, it's a camera camp, uh, cannabidol or you know you have, uh, yeah. the ol is the uh the ol means it has a alcohol molecule on it too yeah. but what happens is that it binds with the plasticizer in the plastic bottle <laughs> so so even some people are using if they're cheap they're gonna buy um a bottle they'll have a glass bottle but their dropper is made of plastic well with we've uh seen just six month old tinctures when you open that bottle up and look at the uh the plastic uh, dropper it's all melted or it's turned yeah. you know, it's really the cannabinoids and the plasticizers but this is the discovery you know a lot of people didn't realize this so we're learning even you yeah. know what daniel speaking to that point that you said specifically um, uh, I'm not sure if it was Leafly Marijuana Moment or, or, or Hemp Industry Daily. One of those um, uh, publications ran an article about the CBD taking the, the paint off of the, the glass. Did you guys hear about that? And because the paint had lead in it, there was lead in the CBD. And I was like, oh my God, I'm like, did we not learn anything over the years? <laughs> yeah, no, no doubt. And I think that's, you know, where we come in with, I'm all for cottage law, like where you can make, you know, whatever uh, cookies at home and sell them. But when it comes to CBD, I, it's no, I'm sorry. This needs to be like, this is something going into, this is, you know, borderline like medicine here going into someone's body and who's taking CBD. Generally, someone is taking it for some kind of issue that they're having. So this, we have to have GMPs, good manufacturing practices involved in this. Well, and THC I think take too. the cottage out of it, you know. THC too, like we were guilty of, and I'm going to point this out, I'm just going to be tr completely transparent about it. We had artificial colors in our, in our first round of gummies that we came out with. And Daniel very quietly and politely, and you know, the way Daniel does things, he's such amazing. He just sends me a private message. He's like, hey brother, he's like, you know, we're trying to help, you know, help people, you know, and these artificial colors that you have in your products, you know, they're carcinogens. So you just might want to look at it. And that was basically da Daniel taking a hammer and hitting me on the head and be like, hey, dude, what the hell are you doing? And, it, and I got the message very, very clear. And I immediately, I was like, okay, no promises, but I'm going to get with the, with the chef in the, in the gummy kitchen, you know, and talk to him. And he's like, oh, he's like, I don't even know why we didn't think about that in the first place. Of course, we're going to use vegetable coloring. And I was like, wow. I'm like, you know, we're talking about. And then what did he say? He said that uh, um, he said it was actually even cheaper. He had no idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds really good. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I think that's the way to do it, you know, like uh, we don't necessarily have to put everybody on blast and like hemp blacklist them over here. We can really just set the bar and incrementally, you know, encourage everyone to meet these standards. And then you have ASTM who, man, they're doing an awesome job. Oh, yeah. I think right now they're on the cannabis <clears throat> terminology, but the end of what ASTM wants to do is have standards for every part of the hemp industry from farming all the way down. This is a global leader in standards. This is who we want 
guiding our standards here and versus the federal government. Yeah, so that's the as that, talking about. Yeah, and I highly recommend anybody in the industry get involved with the D37 committee. Um, it's like $75 a year. You're in all of these meetings. It's all virtual right now. They get really mad if you don't vote on stuff. So like you do have to set aside time or you get like this really mean email that's like, if you don't vote on this, we're kicking you out. But, you know, but it's not that intensive. It's like every couple of months, you have a bunch of stuff to read, one meeting to go to, and you're really getting to see the backside of what these standards are going to eventually be like on a, you know, which I think will be adopted federally at some point or be sort of what we look at in the industry as our baseline. So um, there's a lot of good stuff going on out there, you know, for sure. Um, Katie, are you guys doing anything with like hemp construction out there in Kentucky? Is hemp creek kind of a thing or starting to be? Just trying to get me to tell all my secrets before. <laughs> <laughs> we'll say coming soon to that one. Yeah, well, we, we are actually. Um, you know, let me think, how can I... I share in some of my extraordinary excitement right now. Um, we are getting ready to do something that it's actually something that I used to do in a past life with different materials. Um, but I, I enjoy working outside and doing, you know, some manual labor. So from my past life working in the playground industry and in, in selling playgrounds and installing playgrounds, we kind of picked up some tricks that we're using on hemp now. Super and cool. I, I don't want to jinx anything, um, but essentially, you know, it's using the stock that's left over from the CBD drying process. So if you're, whether you're hand harvesting or trimming or, or you know, as long as you, as long as you have a source for, um, for like chopped up hemp stalks, which is pretty much almost everywhere in the country, like almost everywhere, you can find somebody growing CBD or THC or fiber or whatever that they've got some stock left over. And, and we, we kind of see this as something that can be, um, can be done, it can be repeated all over the country, you know, to anybody who's got that supply of leftover stock and, and some drive to work hard and get outside and, and make some money. So, um, so that's kind of what we're looking at right now. So we do a couple of products right now that, uh, like we have fire starters that we make with the fiber and, and like the leftover stock material. We actually mix it with some of the waste from our oil crushing process, which makes the fire burn really hot. Cause if you just try to burn the stock and maybe I'm giving away too many secrets here, but if you just try to burn the stock by itself, it'll light and it'll catch on fire, but like it doesn't burn super hot. So we use some of the waste from our oil, the, the seed oil to keep that fire burning really hot. We make little fire starters with them. And we've That's been so doing cool. that for a few years now because we didn't want to, you know, we didn't want to waste anything, which is the idea. Now, not, not to say that we're going to make this many fire starters and, you know, it only takes a tiny little bit of fiber and, and a lot of labor. But, um, but we, we wanted to have some kind of outlet for everything. So between the, you know, the fire starters are it so far, but I'm hoping that in the very, very near future, like in the next couple of weeks, we can start announcing some of the jobs that we've been doing in this new product with the, with the hemp fiber or like the, the stalk material and, and start sharing some pictures and video and stuff because We've been working on it for over a year now. We actually have uh, some spots where we've put, we've installed this hemp hemp herd um, like product and it's been there for over a year now. It's just chilling there looking beautiful and, and you know, waiting for people to see it and, and you know. That's cool. more so hemp. exciting. Well, we can't wait to see that, how that works out. And, you know, obviously hemp construction and things like that has little ways <clears throat> to go because there's a lot of codes that have to be passed and all of this kind of thing but how That's exciting because I think this is what we all envisioned when hemp got legalized back in 2014 was like this style of it disrupting every supply chain and so here we are you know six years later like is it going to happen but we can see the progress being mm -hmm. made so it's so cool Katie that you're an intricate part and piece in that puzzle 
Um, got a couple of minutes left, so I do want to talk about the Texas Hemp Awards, which um, the voting is open now. So you uh, submitted your favorites for all of these awesome categories, and now you get to go vote on your favorites. So you can go to TexasHempAwards.com and uh, vote for your favorites. If your favorite was not there, like I've seen a lot of people kind of like, you know, my favorite one's not there. Well, that's because you missed the opportunities to submit them a few weeks ago. And understand this is like virtual. This is the second year of this event. So it's going to get bigger and bigger. Don't worry. Like your favorite one will get nominated next year if they didn't this year. Support the Texas Hemp Awards. I think they're doing a great thing for Texas Hemp, really highlighting people that are doing an amazing job. And that's going to be a virtual event this year in February. And we can't wait to uh, see how it all comes out and congratulate the winners. They got some like sweet Super Bowl rings that are going to the winners. So wow. uh, it should be really interesting. And also want to let you know that the 87th legislative session here in Texas is starting very soon. And if you're interested in getting involved, um, of course, there's a lot of issues that we have here in Texas with the Compassionate Use Act, with the hemp legislation, with smokable hemp. So there's a lot of action items that we've got on the table. So you can go to texasnormal.org and uh, take their survey. They want you to tell them a little bit about yourself so that they can direct you to the right place to be able to uh, do the work with legislature this year, especially because some of this process is gonna be virtual this year, unfortunately. Um, so it's not as just show up as it used to be, show up at the Capitol and we all have fun and talk to people. It's gotta be a little bit more organized. So uh, make sure that you do that. And lastly, if you go over to YouTube, we recorded a really cool video with Greenbelt Botanicals pairing movies and hemp. We took their top five smokable flower products and uh, they're located right next to Alamo Draft House. So, which is a, an awesome movie theater here. So we thought, hey, let's pick out movies. So we discussed each strain, what the main terpenes were in the strain. And then we paired them up with uh, our favorite movie choices. So you go check out that video. Mm -hmm. It's uh, gonna be, it's up on our website as well on the blog. And then it's there under our YouTube page. So check it out. It was a lot of fun. Shout out to Mindy and the team at Greenbelt for, uh, for doing that with us. It was awesome. We appreciate them being a partner with Higher Ed Hemp Tours. And then lastly, let's go back through where you can find our amazing guests today. You can go over to Instagram.com backslash Gringo Delivered. Facebook and, too. And Facebook too. And you can hit the link tree. Let's see what you guys got in the link tree. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You got good stuff. Twitter too. So go follow Gringo Delivered, Austin Source for legal delivered cannabis. And then you can check out KentuckyHempWorks.com to talk to Katie and see all their awesome products. They've got some really cool stuff here. The Hemp Root Salve, uh, Kentucky Made. Isn't that so cool? I love yes. it so much. So go support Kentucky Hemp Works and look for Katie on TikTok. We didn't talk too much about that just a little bit in the beginning, but you're always having some fun on TikTok. So can we expect maybe like a Christmas hemp TikTok video? Uh, yeah, I think Christmas, but before that, I have a, a, a TikTok idea for our hand sanitizer because we don't, we don't just import sanitizer from Johnson and Johnson around here. Like we get our sanitizer from local moonshiners the way it's supposed to be. That's so, right. So yeah, we, uh, I, I do, I, I just had a little eureka moment earlier today and I was like, oh, okay, we need, we need some commercials for the sanitizer. Let's, uh, let's make it a Kentucky, a Kentucky thing. So yeah. I can't but wait yeah, for that. Always something cool. for Christmas. I, I don't know what I'm going to do for Christmas yet, but we'll figure that out. And that's, it's Kentucky Hip Works on TikTok? Yes, and it's the same as all our other social media handles, which is uh, KY, KY Hemp Works. Amazing. Oh, all right, team. Nice. We'll, have, we'll have our apps out hopefully in a couple months. Thank you. Yes, perfect. Thanks, Paul. No, you're good. Yeah, absolutely. So look for the Gringo Delivered app um and follow kentucky hemp works on all the social channels you will not be disappointed for sure thank you all so much for joining us today it's been a blast we're going to catch y'all next week actually we are going to be off the air for the next two weeks 
Cynthia is uh, taking a much needed vacation. She's down in the RGV <laughs> down in South Texas. And uh, we've got our niece coming in and I don't think that she would actually, she would probably love to be on the live stream, but anyway, yeah, I think she would. we're going to yeah. take the next two weeks off and we're going to catch y'all in 2021. So hey, thanks, thanks so much. Leah and Daniel and Cynthia. Seriously. Thank you. It's the bottom of our hearts. Uh, oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you all so much. All right. Let's yeah, roll thank it. You. Thank and you happy so holidays, much. everyone. Happy holidays. <laughs>